Okay, so some of you have probably figured this out based on the title, but I have now finished the Halo Trilogy by Alexandra Adornetto. This is the latest crappy angel, young adult, twilight clone romance thing that I bought a lot of, well, almost a year ago now. And this is just the most recent one, and I will say, it's the worst one so far. Because, like, look, I read Fallen, and that one was, that, that one was awful. That one was really bad. I'm not gonna pretend it wasn't. But it did have moments that I liked. You know, there were a few little bits that I was into, and there were some ideas that, even if they weren't explored the way they probably should have been, they were interesting ideas that did uh, pull me in a little bit. But overall, it was, you know, a, a bad story. And Hush Hush, I actually thought was okay, and you can actually check out my review of it, uh, which I posted back in January, because by the view count, a lot of you did not check out that review, so go do that. And uh, that, that one, again, had some dumb stuff in it, but overall I was like, yeah, this, this is alright. Halo is basically all of the boring bits from Fallen and Hush Hush, but without any of the fun ones. Like, this shit does not even try. It does not try to have a story, or mystery, or tension, or character development of any sort. Like, I I'm not even joking with that. Pretty much every character in this entire series begins it the same way they end it. Or, in some cases, they regress. I did not even realize that was possible. Well, first of all, through God, all things are possible, so jot that down. Now, I'll admit that before I started this one, I did have hope. Like, maybe it was foolish of me to have hope, but I had hope, because this one is at least a little bit different. See, normally with these, you know, crappy Twilight clones, uh, it's a normal girl who just runs into a supernatural boy, and then they have a crazy romance with... It, it's not actually crazy, it's just really stupid and boring and sometimes abusive. But in this case, it was the opposite. See, the main character, Bethany, is an angel who comes down to Earth, along with other angels, and she meets a human boy, and they fall in love. So, in that case, okay, at least the main character sounds like she would be the more interesting one, rather than her love interest, and maybe she'll be less of a damsel in distress, which... I turned out to be wrong about that, but, um... Well, I had hope. Now, like I said, Bethany is an angel who comes down to Earth, along with a couple of other angels, to help humans. You know, like, the world is full of all these problems, crime, natural disasters, war, all that, and so the angels come down to help humans get rid of all that and make the world better. The thing is, Bethany and company don't go to, like, a war zone or a country plagued with famine or anything like that that they could actually help people. They just go to a regular small town, which doesn't have any major issues, and while she's there, she meets a cute boy. And that is, that's basically the whole series. See, in the first book, there really isn't any conflict at all for the majority of the, uh, of the page count. Like, the biggest question, uh, that we're supposed to care so much about, that we're thinking, oh man, I hope this works out for the main characters, like, the biggest issue is, who is Bethany gonna take to prom? And we'll, we'll get more into that when we reach that point, but, yeah, that's the biggest problem. This whole thing is nothing but first world problems, which might be fine. Well, actually, it wouldn't be fine, but it, this thing is almost 500 pages long. And there's a little bit of a plot that comes in at the very end, but nonetheless, this is a lot. And then the second one, uh, which is Hades, I will admit this one is the best, which is not saying much, but it is, you know, it, it is the best credit where it's due, because this one at least tries to have a storyline. You know, like, there is something bad that happens near the beginning, and then the rest of the book is Bethany and the other characters trying to fix it uh, and make sure that nothing horrible happens to them after that. And I'm... You know, I was never into it, but I could at least see that it was trying. And then when they got to the third book, Heaven, they just completely gave up. Like, there's, there's absolutely no plot with that one. Or, more accurately, there's like seven different storylines which do not intersect at all and are all solved very easily. But, again, we will, we will get to that when we have to get to that. Now, normally, when I'm doing uh, book reviews, but especially when I'm doing these really long, in-depth ones, 
I try to avoid other reviews. Like, you know, I try to avoid looking at them on Goodreads and stuff because I just want to go into it with as blank of a slate as I can so that I, my opinion isn't being uh, affected by anyone else's. This one, I, I made an exception, and just out of curiosity, I did check out the reviews on Goodreads. And the thing is, with most books, whatever their genre, whatever their intended audience, most of the time, the top couple of reviews, you will have both one-star reviews and five-star reviews, because there will be people that loved it that wrote something that was helpful for others, so they pushed it to the top, and there'll be people that hated it, and they wrote a review that was helpful for, helpful for others, so they pushed it to the top. This one, all of the top reviews are one star. You have to go down 18 spots before you hit anything that's higher than a one star. Oh, shit. That's... That's a bad sign. Like, I knew at that point that maybe I shouldn't have hope. And in fact, most of my hope was dashed at that point. But still, still, I did, uh, I did keep an open mind as much as I could. And, man, this review... I I don't know if it's going to be really all that long. This one might be relatively short because despite the forest of tabs that I put in these, um, it's mostly just boring. You know, like, there, sure, there's some story beats and stuff where I can point out, okay, that was kind of dumb, and there's some bits about, like, the world and stuff that I can point out that doesn't really make much sense and then we can talk about, but there's only so many different ways I can say, like, yeah, this bit was unexciting, and there's not really anything interesting happening here. And then this other bit was not very exciting, and there's nothing happening here, they're just kind of wandering around doing stuff. Like, there's only so many different ways I can do that, so we'll have to wait and see, but is, this one might be short. So let's begin with the first book, Halo. Now this one, like most terrible books, opens with a couple of pretentious quotes that have nothing to do with the story at hand. The first one, is something from Romeo and Juliet, which I don't care about. And the second one is from Beyonce, Halo. Baby, I can see your halo. You know you're my saving grace, which is a dumb song and I don't like it. And it doesn't really tie into anything other than, oh, it's about angels. Now, the story itself opens up with Bethany and the other angels descending down to Earth and they get seen by somebody, but it's not really a big deal. He looked up just in time to see a column of white light receding into the clouds leaving three wraith-like strangers standing in the middle of the road. Despite our human form, something about us startled him. Perhaps it was our skin, which was as luminous as the moon, or our loose white traveling garments, which were in tatters from the turbulent descent. Perhaps it was the way he looked at our limbs, as though we had no idea what to do with them, or the water vapor still clinging to our hair. Whatever the reason, the boy lost his balance, swerved his bike, and crashed into the gutter. He scrambled to his feet and stood transfixed for several seconds, caught between alarm and curiosity. In unison, we reached out our hands in what we hoped to him was a gesture of reassurance, but forgot to smile. By the time we remembered how, it was too late. As we contorted our mouths in an attempt to get it right, the boy turned on his heel and fled. Having a physical body was still foreign to us. There were so many different parts that needed to run concurrently, like a complex machine. The muscles in my face and body were stiff. My legs were trembling like a child's taking his first steps, and my eyes hadn't yet adjusted to the muted earth light. Having come from a place of dazzling light, shadows were foreign to us. Gabriel approached the bicycle with its front wheel still spinning and righted it. He propped it up against the closest fence, knowing the boy would return later to collect it. Are you seeing the problem yet? You might have to think about it for a minute or two, but the issue is that everything that happens in this book, like every setting, every character description, every little detailed action that happens, has way too much detail and goes off on a million little tangents. Like, this whole bit... I I'm not saying you can't have detail in your writing. Like, some people prefer having a lot. I myself sometimes prefer it, but you gotta know when to cut the fat. And this is definitely an event where you cut the fat. Like, this whole um, almost a page and a half that I just read should have been condensed down to, like, three quarters of a page, maybe, and it would have been fine. But the thing is, just doing it this once at the beginning, not that big a deal. Every scene in this book does it. Like, every scene goes on around 25 to 30% longer than it needs to just because of that. Like, there are scenes where characters are having a conversation, there will be one line of dialogue, and then about a page of description and Bethany's thoughts and just going off on random tangents, and then the response. Uh, to that line of dialogue. And that happened multiple times, and several times 
I, by the time we got to the response, I had forgotten what was said earlier, so I had to go back real quick and check and go, oh, yeah, okay, that was it. Like, it feels kind of like the author thought that this book was too short, this 500-page book was too short, and then rather than adding, like, additional subplots or character development or anything like that, she just decided to throw a bunch more description in there and way overdid it, which is how we got to this length. And... The thing about having too much description as well is that when it's constant, when it's all the time, it feels like everything is supposed to be important, which means that nothing is important, and that tends to make readers space out. Like, there were a lot of points in this where I just spaced out and read a couple of paragraphs and realized that I did not comprehend anything that had happened. And that happens sometimes when I'm, like, sleepy or something. Usually I'll just go back and reread it so I can make sure I didn't miss anything. In this... Sometimes I would get a few paragraphs or a page in and realize I had caught nothing and I would just keep going. And maybe there was something important there, but I kind of doubt it. So the three angels here are, like I said, Bethany and then her siblings, siblings, Gabriel and Ivy. And they're all just angels who, like I said before, were sent down by God to this town. It's called Venus Cove and they're here to make it better. It's a very vague mission. Uh, the parameters are never really properly explained, and they never do a whole lot to make it better anyways, so... Okay, whatever. And then they just go to their new house, which was already uh, purchased for them, I guess. Or maybe God just made it appear and everyone n never really thought about it being there. I don't know, it's not really explained, but it's not that important. And the angels are also unused to being in the physical world, you know, because up in heaven, they don't really have bodies, and there aren't physical objects or anything. So, Bethany in particular is kind of weirded out by having a body, and is freaked out by, like, all the objects and stuff that she can see around her. I mean, trees? Everywhere trees? What the hell is this place? And about five pages in, uh, it's mentioned that they're visited by a faceless, white-robed mentor, who they never get a name for, and he's just a guy who comes down from heaven, gives them advice, and tells them, like, hey, God wants you to uh, start doing this. At least that's what Bethany claims that he's doing, because he's mentioned this one time on page five and then never comes up again throughout the rest of the series. He's never even mentioned again. So I'm really not sure what the point of that was. That feels like something that, like, an editor would go through and say, uh, hey, this never comes back, so why don't you just cut that out? It's, it's unimportant, and it saves a little bit of time. Now, for a couple of weeks after being brought down, Bethany and Gabriel and Ivy are all just kind of wandering around town observing humans, and apparently part of their mission parameters is that they're not supposed to interact with them too much. Um, okay, if that's the case, how are you supposed to help them? Like, uh, later on they mention, like, you're not supposed to get into real relationships with humans, relationships with humans, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get there, because that has its own issues, but it would at least make sense if that was a rule, but in this it's like, you can't interact with humans, well then how are you supposed to help them? You know, if you were like a doctor or something useful like that, then you would have to, you know, talk with people and interact with them in order to help heal them. And in this case, like, okay, you're just trying to make this town better, how are you supposed to do that without really interacting or talking with people? So then they just uh, walk by the beach one day, and while she's there, Beth meets this really cute boy whose name is Xavier, or Xavier. I've actually, I've met people who have been named that, who have pronounced it both ways, so I'm not sure, but either way, uh, she meets him, and she's just immediately infatuated with him. You know, they, they don't have to talk or get to know each other or anything, she's just instantly in love with him, and from this point forward, she's obsessed with him. And it doesn't matter why she is, because, you know, it's not like we read romance to see people connect or anything. She's just super into him, and he's kind of into her, and then that's it. That's, that, that's the whole story from then on. And uh, after this point, while Bethany is thinking about how, oh, I'm not supposed to interact with humans, but she's also wondering, like, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me, don't hurt me no more. Haha, ha, I made that joke, now let's move it out of the way. But... Bethany just thinks about love like, what is it? You know, I love all of humanity, but what does it mean to love just a single person? You know, like, to, to, the, to the point where you don't even care about the whole rest of the world as much as you care about them. What's that like? And I just don't care. I, I don't care. And uh, while they're introducing Gabe and Ivy, uh, they give them, like, really basic backstories. 
and I mean they're not that um that they're not that interesting but they're there like you know they're just they were angels who've been around for thousands of years and Gabe was actually the one who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible which is kind of nuts and like when I heard that I was like oh this is actually kind of interesting I wonder what'll happen with this and nothing nothing happens with it again it's it never comes back up ever again like this dude killed thousands of people on the orders of God which would kind of imply that he is a hard ass and a stickler for rules which granted that is uh, established as part of his personality and they keep with that throughout most of the series but they they never do anything with that the the fact that he has such a nutty backstory they they never do anything with that so what was the point of having it and then we obviously get a long ass description of what bethany looks like and how she's just so plain but she's also impossibly gorgeous with no effort whatsoever i on the other hand was nothing special just a plain old transition angel in my physical form, I looked ethereal like my family, except my eyes were as brown as river stones, and my chestnut brown hair fell in loose waves down my back. I thought that once I was recruited for an earth posting, I'd be able to choose my own physical form, but it didn't work that way. I was created small, fine-boned, and not especially tall, with a heart-shaped face, pixie-like ears, and skin that was milky pale. Whenever I caught a glimpse of my reflection in the mirror, I saw an eagerness that was missing from the faces of my siblings. Even when I tried, I could never look as removed as Gabe and Ivy. Now, this idea of just being obnoxiously beautiful all the time with no effort is obviously part of the fantasy. Like, you know, the teenage girls who this is aimed at are gonna be into that. And like, okay, there's nothing wrong with having a fantasy like that. It's, I'm not the target audience, but, the, you know, it's fine. If that's your thing, that's your thing. But this is really fucking stupid and over the top and obnoxious. Like, oh my goodness. And the thing is, I, like I said, Bethany is this the supernatural half of this relationship in this one. So I was thinking like, okay, maybe she will be the more interesting character because, you know, she's not just a regular person. And around this time, my hopes were dashed because even as an angel, Bethany is plain and boring. You know, she really doesn't have any hobbies. She doesn't have all that much personality. Like, wh what is her personality? Like, she, she loves Xavier. Xavier, whatever. I'm, I'm probably going to be going back and forth between those. Uh, she loves Xavier, she loves her siblings, and she doesn't want other people to get hurt. And that, that's really it, you know? She, she never really has anything that she wants for herself. She never decides, oh, I want to be a doctor, or anything like that. She just... She exists, and we're supposed to be into her for that reason. Like, the audience is supposed to love her for that reason. And I just, um... I just, I, I just can't do that. And uh, after they've been in town for a little while, the school year starts, and Bethany uh, just, you know, attends school because she's around 17 years old. Like, she's actually, she, she isn't an angel who's thousands of years old, but she looks 17. She is actually 17 years old. She was created uh, around that, that long ago. So, okay, again, at least it makes sense that she would act kind of childish at times because she actually is, so one point in this book's favor. And uh, while she's at school, Gabriel is also going to school, but he's there as the music teacher. And again, how are you supposed to help people at, at all in this situation? Like, okay, Bethany is there just existing almost as a teenager. Gabriel, you could maybe make a, an argument for, like, oh, he's a teacher, he's helping to mold young minds and all that stuff, which, okay, I could, I could kind of see that, but they don't really talk about it ever. And, again, if you're not supposed to interact with humans all that much, then how are you supposed to connect with them and help mold their minds in that case? Like, th these are the sort of things that you have to think about if you're gonna write a story like this. And then Bethany describes the school as though she's a movie executive from the 80s. Even in school uniform, it wasn't difficult to distinguish the particular social groups I'd observed in The Kingdom. The music posse was made up of boys with shoulder-length hair, untidy strands falling over their eyes. They carried instrument cases and had musical chords scrawled on their arms in black felt pen. There was a small minority of goths who had set themselves apart by use of heavy eye makeup and spiky hairdos, and I wondered how they got away with it. Surely it must contravene school regulations. Those who liked to think of themselves as artistic had accessorized the uniforms with berets or hats and colorful scarves. Some girls traveled in packs, like a group of platinum blondes who crossed the road with their arms linked. 
The academic types were easily identified. They wore pristine uniforms with no alterations and carried the official school backpack. They tended to walk with a missionary zeal, heads down, eager to reach the sanctity of the library. I, I know that was already long, but trust me, it goes on. It goes on even longer. And the thing is, that, that's not how teenagers act, guys. It's, it's not that easy. We're, they're, they're humans. They're not that stereotypical, okay? They, they, their social groups don't line up that nicely. Which, it, it feels like it was written by a 40-year-old man. Alexandra Adornetto was around 16 when she wrote this. Like, how, how does she not know better? So Bethany, on her way to class, meets a girl named Molly, and now they're best friends? Because that's kind of just how fiction works, apparently. Like, the first person you ever interact with at a new place is just going to be your best friend. And because of that, they don't need to spend any time showing how they become friends, or why they like each other, or why they enjoy being around each other. They're just friends from that point forward. And uh, Bethany is late to class, so her teacher says, Hey, you're late to class, Miss Church. And that's when I learned. Bethany's full name is Bethany Church. You, you named an angel... You named your angel character. You, you took your character who's from heaven, who's a direct creation of God, who's, who's here to do God's will. You took your angel character. You named her Church. You named three of them Church. What's Molly's last name? Pills? So then the teacher, just not even rudely, he just tells them, hey, like, don't be late to my class, guys, you're interrupting everybody. And then when they sit down, Molly... Molly says this. Don't worry about Belt, she whispered, seeing my look of surprise. He's a total stiff, bitter and twisted after his wife served the divorce papers. The only thing that gets him going these days is his new convertible, which he looks like a loser driving. Oh my god, Molly, why are you such a bitch? Like, it, this dude is not even being that mean to you. He's just... He's just a teacher. He's doing his job. Leave him alone. And the thing is, b b uh, not Bethany, Molly continues acting like that throughout the whole series. Like, right after that, the teacher asks her, Miss Harrison, I assume you are explaining to our new student the concept of covalent bonding? And she says, um, not exactly, Mr. Belt, Molly replied. I don't want to bore her to death on her first day. Like, oh my god, am I supposed to like Molly? Because I don't. Like, just those two little lines at the beginning, I was like, I really don't like this bitch. And she continues acting like that throughout the whole rest of the series. So then, not long after this, Bethany runs into Xavier, because apparently he goes to their school. And, uh, her and Molly both thirst over him, because, like, he's so pretty, he has his bright blue eyes, and he's tall and athletic and everything. Is it, is it just me, or do the love interests, like, the male love interest in these always seem to have blue eyes? Like... It, it seems weird. You'd think once in a while they'd be like green or brown or something, but they, they always seem to be blue. Icy blue, specifically. Icy blue eyes. I, I don't know why that was a thing. but And it, it's mentioned that Xavier is the school captain. Now, at this point, I started to get a little confused. Because um, the, the author, Alexandra Adornetto, is Australian. But uh, when this book started off, they don't specify where Venus Cove is. So... I had just sort of subconsciously assumed that it took place in the United States, partially because a lot of stuff that I that I read takes place here, and partially just because, you know, it's I guess it's just the ugly American thing to do, assume the whole world revolves around us. And when they said school captain, like, we don't have that here. Like, that's a thing that's really only in the British Dominion, or former British Dominion, so places like the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, they have that. And so I just... Uh, and, you know, knowing the author was Australian, I just assumed, like, oh, okay, I guess it was in Australia. Okay, that was, that was my mistake. But the thing is, they, um, the, the author doesn't seem to have known which place she wanted it to be in, because she, le she drops details like that, which imply it's in Australia, but then she drops some that imply it's in the United States as well. Like, I mentioned before, the big dance at the end of the year, they call it prom which is an American name. They don't call it that in Australia, or anywhere else in the British Dominion, for that matter. Uh, they wear school uniforms, even though it's a public school, which is kind of the norm in Australia and other places. Now, granted, in the United States, there are a couple of public schools which will make you wear a uniform, so this doesn't automatically mean it's not in the U.S., but it's pretty rare for that to happen. And then there's also, like, a train that goes from their small town to the city, like, apparently the public transport actually works there, which is definitely not how it is in the United States. Um, it's mentioned that 
Xavier is on the rugby team, and rugby is just not a big sport here, like at all. It, I mean, uh, American football is kind of similar, and actually in the second and third books they change it so that he is on the football team, but the, the point is, in this beginning one, he's on the rugby team, which just isn't that big here. And uh, it's mentioned that some people have a southern drawl, which usually is used to describe people from the southern United States who have that accent, so implies it's here. And then, uh, at one point, it's mentioned that you have to be 21 years old to buy beer, whereas in Australia, the drinking age is 18. So, there's so many things that were pulling me in so many different directions, and I was just very confused about where this place was supposed to be. And I guess it's not that big a deal, but it did still bother me. And anyways, in the second book, they do confirm that it's in the United States. Specifically, it's in Georgia. So, there. All I'm saying is that if you're gonna write a story that takes place somewhere where you don't live and that you're not that familiar with, do a little bit of research first. You know, so you, so you catch things like that, and then you can iron them, iron them over. Th these details would be very easy to have changed. So anyways, uh, Bethany finds out from Molly that Xavier's old girlfriend, whose name was Emily, uh, two years before the story takes place, Emily died in a house fire, <clears throat> and now Xavier is, is super sad and hasn't dated anyone since then. Which, I guess that's another part of the fantasy, because Bethany immediately thinks, Ooh, I can fix him. I can make him better. I, 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 all he needs is some love, and he'll instantly get over his depression and fears of abandonment. That, that's how that works. Uh, Bethany goes to gym class where it's revealed that angels don't sweat and they have infinite energy because they're perfect, but at the same time their bodies are still mortal, uh, w like they still need to eat food and stuff, and I, I don't believe they ever directly say, but it is implied that if they die in their body, then like their body will die, but their angel form will just go back to heaven when that happens, so I, I, I don't know, it, it feels... That feels contradictory to me. It feels like they wouldn't need to eat or anything in that scenario, but whatever, whatever, whatever. And anyways, Bethany, you know, makes friends, and Gabriel is, like, upset with her because of it, and he says, Blending in is one thing, but do you realize that friends require time and energy, said Gabriel. They'll want to bond, and... <sighs> okay, I've, I've said it more than once, but, like, how are you supposed to help people if you can't really interact with them? And if you're afraid of spending time and energy interacting with humans, how the hell are you supposed to help them? At all. I... <sighs> okay. Yeah. So Molly runs into Bethany and Gabriel while they're out on the town, and Molly starts crushing on Gabriel immediately, which is kind of gross because he's a teacher at her school. Why, why is that such a common fucking plot points in these stupid, shitty, young adult romance novels. Oh my god, it's so creepy, guys. I had a teacher that did that when I was in high school. It's creepy. Can we stop for once? Just once, I'd like to read this and go, yeah, there's no inappropriate student-teacher relationships here. Like, j please. Granted, Gabriel's not interested in her, but still, the, the, it's there, and it continues coming up throughout the rest of the series. Like, we'll, we'll talk about it more in more detail later, but j whatever, whatever. So, Bethany dreams that while she's asleep, Xavier comes into her room and kisses her. And I think it's a dream, but it seems real. Doesn't matter because this, uh, this leads nowhere. Uh, they have a neighbor who pops in to say hello and gives them food, and they spend several pages getting to know her, and this leads nowhere. In fact, that neighbor never shows up again. Um, Bethany goes to a fortune teller and has like her palms read, and the lady gives her a bad fortune, and she's like, Oh, you have no lifeline. I don't understand. This could not be good for you. And this, this leads nowhere. Like, there's so many subplots like that that just... They have no point. Which kind of ties into my theory that the author thought it was too short, and so just threw some stuff in there without really thinking about how, how it would uh, tie in. And if you want proof of how much it doesn't tie in, I'm mainly going to be skipping over a lot of these subplots in all three books, and you're not really going to notice. So Xavier and Bethany meet, and they start talking with one another, and they spend a little more time together, and they seem to be getting into each other, like... Uh, this part of the book, like, sure, it could be a lot worse. I... like, these bits of dialogue almost sound like something humans could say. Uh, Bethany likes 
Xavier because he's kind, he's smart, uh, he has a lot of younger siblings, and he's a very good brother to them. And so, in that regard, yeah, it is better than other romance, where, they, like Fallen, for example, the main character, Lucinda, liked Daniel just because she did. You know, like, there's literally never a reason given. Even when people ask her, like, why do you love him? She's got, she says, well, I just do. You know, so, like, this is better than that, at least. Um, but at the same time, like, why does Xavier like Bethany? You know, it's like, she's pretty, sure, but beyond that, she... What does she do? What personality does she have? Do they have any hobbies in common? Is, is he attracted to the way she's, like, super kind and does nice things for other people? Because she doesn't really that much. Like, what... What does... What does this lead to? Why? The only reason you like her is because she's the lead. That's all. That's all. That's the only reason. And it's especially stupid because later on, Xavier just describes her as being interesting. Like, like he says, hey, you're interesting. She says, there's nothing interesting about me. And he says, I disagree. Even your reaction to being called interesting is interesting. Like, why? What is it about this girl that, that you find attractive, that you find neat? Okay, okay, okay. So throughout all of this, Molly is just obsessed with finding a prom date. And I do mean obsessed. She brings it up on page 40, 124, page 44, page 299, and a couple of other times. Like, she just constantly is constant, like, oh, I need attention and validation from boys. Like, there's nothing I like about Molly. I hate Molly so much. Now, after a little while, like after Bethany and Xavier have been together for a couple of weeks, I think, she actually does decide to just let him know that she's an angel. And so, like, on the beach one night, she shows him, like, hey, I don't leave footprints when I'm walking in the sand. And he's like, wait, how are you doing that? And then she shows off her wings, and he's like, whoa, you're an angel. That's, that's really weird, but I'm okay with it. And I'll be honest, this is one of the better parts of the of the series because it doesn't really waste time y you know like with a lot of these types of stories it would be something like oh she has to keep this a secret or bad things will happen and then like that's the main crux of the conflict i guess is her just trying to keep this part of herself hidden from her boyfriend and if he ever finds out bad things will happen and then he finds out and like they break up for 50 pages or whatever, and then he decides, uh, you know what, I don't actually care what you are because I love you. Something like that, you know, like, just just wasting no time with it, so I'm okay with this. But at the same time, uh, Bethany was told that she cannot tell humans uh, what she is or she'll get in trouble, and then Gabriel finds out about it, and he's like, I'm really pissed, I'm gonna have to tell the other angels. And they tells the other angels, and they think it over for a little while, and they're like, nah, you're fine, so... Bethany just gets let off and she's not in trouble anymore. Great. So by this point, we're over halfway through the book. And I'm not joking. Like, this next bit is page 260, and it's less than 500 pages, so we're more than halfway through. And they introduce a new character named Jake. Now, Jake is English. He's a new guy at their school. He just came in. He's a bad boy, and he likes poetry. So basically, basically just think Harry Styles in After or whatever he was called in the movie version. Like, you know, Voldemort's nephew, guy with all the tattoos, and he liked to read because, I don't know, the author thinks that's attractive, which, I mean, it is, to be fair. But, you know, just think of him and change very little. And everyone really likes him as soon as he shows up, which I just have to wonder why. Because he's just kind of rude to everyone and acts like he's above them. Uh, occasionally people will ask him for help with things and he'll uh, continue being rude as well, so he's not very helpful. He doesn't really do anything that other people would be interested in or be or find fine, fun. Excuse me. Uh, he sexually harasses a couple of people, including his teacher at one point, and his teacher seems into it, which is really weird and uncomfortable. And a lot of time is spent on him at this sec section of the book, is the thing. And he doesn't really do anything until later. L like, he pops up, you know, like a hundred pages from the end again, and he th that's when he becomes more important, but 
throughout this whole segment, he's not doing anything. He's just there. It's just a bunch of time spent on this character who we know nothing about, and we don't like him, and he doesn't have any mystery or intrigue to him. He's just there, and they spend a lot of time on it, and it's boring. So Bethany goes with her friends to go shopping for prom dresses, which, like, okay, sure, that's a normal thing that girls do. And Molly starts asking about her and Xavier's sex life. Sorry, she said, you just surprised me. I mean, well, I just thought you would have. But you've done other stuff, yeah? Sure, we go for walks, hold hands, share lunch. My god, Beth, how old are you? Molly groaned. Do I have to spell everything out for you? She narrowed her eyes. Wait, have you even seen it? Seen what? I exploded. You know, she said emphatically. It. She gestured in the vicinity of her groin until I finally understood her meaning. Oh, I exclaimed. I'd never do anything like that. Well, hasn't he hinted that he wants more? No, I said indignantly. Xavier doesn't care about stuff like that. That's what they all say at first, Molly said cynically. Just give it some time. Great as Xavier is, all guys want the same thing. Okay, first of all, Molly, you are prying a lot and you're being very judgmental, so you're kind of being a bitch about this. And I, I, I feel like I'm just repeating myself over and over that Molly is a bitch, but she really is. And um, Bethany and Xavier, yeah, they, they haven't done anything sexual at this point. And after this, Bethany does bring it up with Xavier, and he's like, yeah, it's, it's fine, it's whatever. Because they just decide they're gonna wait until marriage, I guess, because they're already thinking about it, okay, sure, we're, we're not we're not gonna think too hard about this because the authors clearly didn't. The, the author, editor, publishers, not, none of them did. Uh, but I do just want to point out that, yes, this is a huge part of the fantasy as well, that this dude really wants to have sex with you, but he also respects you enough to never ever bring it up until you do. Like, you know, he doesn't have his own desires or anything. And the thing about this is that this might have been fine if it led somewhere. Like, you know, if there was some sort of conflict that arose of this. Like, maybe Xavier did want to have sex with her and he was a little too pushy with it. Like, that would, that would be an asshole move, but at least it would bring conflict up. Or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe Bethany suddenly decides, you know what, yeah, I'm really horny and I want to have sex with my human boyfriend, but he's more uncomfortable with it and is kind of pushing her away. Like, that would be, there would be some conflict there. You know, it would be characters who want different things and they have to struggle with one another until they either come to a compromise, or one of them loses, or something like that. And this whole book has had no conflict so far. Have you realized that yet? Like, when Bethany falls in love with this dude, she doesn't need to do anything to attract him, or get him out of his shell, or anything like that. They're just, they meet, and then they're together. Uh, Bethany doesn't have trouble fitting in at the school, they just meet and they're together. Uh, they're supposed to be helping save the world and make it better for everybody but they just, they just aren't. They just aren't doing anything. Like, there's, there's no conflict in any of this at all so far. It takes about 350 pages before a conflict arises, and it's the dumbest fucking conflict of all time. So, basically, Xavier is at his rugby practice, and he gets a nasty tackle, and he's not too badly hurt, but he does get a concussion, and he has to stay in the hospital to be uh, examined for a couple of days. You know, just make sure nothing too bad happened. And because of his stay in the hospital, it, it's not life-threatening. Again, remember, it's not life-threatening. He's he, He'll be fine. But because of his stay in the hospital, he can't go to prom with Bethany. And that's like, that that's the big conflict that sets up everything else that happens in the book. I have felt more thrills washing my hands. And the thing is, I... <laughs> I have personal beef with this bit because Weirdly enough, I was in this situation myself. When I was 18 years old, my date to my senior prom could not come with me because she was in the hospital. Like, the circumstances were a bit different, but, you know, similar idea. And so I just went with my friends, and did it suck? Yeah. Yeah, it did suck. Like, I, I felt a little bit of sympathy for Bethany at first. I was like, yeah, that does suck. But life goes on, is the thing. Like, even at the time, I was thinking, yeah, it'll be all right. We'll... We'll get past this. Life life continues. And lo and behold, it's <laughs> however many years later, I don't even remember. But six? Six years? Oh shit, I'm old. But it's this many years later, and 
I'm still here. <laughs> so when Bethany was still whining about it for page after page after page, I was thinking, okay, grow the fuck up, girl. Like, I, I know you're 17 years old, but grow, grow the fuck up. Like, the, the one positive I can say about Bethany being uh, so young is that she's not like a thousand-year-old angel, demon, supernatural creature or whatever that's creeping on a 17-year-old boy. Like, you know, Twilight and stuff do that, and I find it, I find it unpleasant. So at least in this, they're both age-appropriate for each other. What? I never statutory raped anyone before. So anyways, Jake asks Bethany to prom instead. He's like, hey, I heard your boyfriend's in trouble. Like, I could take you instead. And he actually sexually harasses her a bit while doing this. Like, he gets too close to her and puts his hands around her shoulders and stuff. It's, it's kind of creepy, bro. But, you know, she, she agrees to go with him because she's stupid. You know, this... Seriously, this guy is about as trustworthy as dirty needles in a parking lot. Alright, so from this point forward, we have, like, the actual conflict of the book, and I'm just gonna roll right through it, because the book kind of rolls right through it. Like, they go to prom. Uh, while they're there, Bethany is having a decent enough time. She's like, you know what? Jake is a nice guy. I I wish I was here with, uh, with Xavier instead, but, you know, Jake is... he's alright. And then it, he starts talking, and he reveals that he knows she's an angel, and she's like, what? How do you know that? And it's because Jake is a demon, actually. And he's like, you're gonna be mine soon. She's like, no, and they run off and she stays away from him. And then in order to lure her out, Jake kills Taylor, who's Taylor is one of the girls that Bethany is apparently friends with. Like I, when it said Taylor's dead, I actually didn't even realize who that was at first because she's mentioned maybe twice before this point. Um, anyways, uh, Bethany is like, I can't let him kill anybody else. So she agrees to go with him and basically gets kidnapped and he sets up a ritual, he's about to drag her down to hell, and then Gabriel appears and banishes him to hell by stabbing him with a sword. And then Jake hints that he'll be back. Now, like I said, that's fast, but out of this almost 500 page book, all of that is like 80 pages. You know, there's no time for investment, you know, to, to get invested in the story and think like, oh man, if this, if they don't do this, What's going to happen with Bethany? Is she gonna get hurt? Is Xavier gonna get hurt? Like, there's no time for any of that. Uh, there's no time for character development, you know, for the people to go through struggles and come out differently or be faced with difficult questions about what kind of person they want to be, anything like that. Uh, there's no time for, like, the back and forth that usually accompanies pretty much any sort of plot, really. You know, like, if, if we're talking a mystery, for example, the back and forth would be okay, we know that there was this crime or something that was committed, and they're trying to gather clues. So like, okay, we'll gather this clue and investigate it, and then we'll go to this clue. Oh, that's a dead end. Okay, let's go somewhere else. And, you know, like, stories have back and forth like that, and this, this doesn't. It's just, bad guy's here, bad guy kidnaps, bad guy's gone. And that's it. And I also want to point out that even though Bethany is the main character, and even though she's the supernatural love interest here, and even though she's supposed to have some of these kind of neat powers that Xavier doesn't, she's still the damsel in distress. You know, she still doesn't really get to do anything or save the day, even though this is her story. She just gets kidnapped and then gets saved by two men. And I guess that's kind of sexist, but... I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to make an unnecessary accusation of that, and I don't really feel like getting into that topic at the moment, but it does feel that way, you know, if the shoe fits. And... Yeah, anyways, Jake will be back. On to book two, Hades. So as I said earlier, Hades is the best one because it is the only one with conflict. And plus it's about 15% shorter than the last one. Like, they, they trimmed it down quite a bit. Both this one and the last one, like, I'll, I'll give them credit for that. Like, they seem to have realized, okay, Halo, it really did drag for a while, so Hades in Heaven will trim it down, so that's good. And the plot to this one is basically that Bethany gets dragged down to hell by by Jake and she has to try and escape and okay that that sounds good on paper at least like the character wants something she wants to escape there's another character the villain who wants something different they want to prevent them from reaching that goal and so they have to uh, fight against each other you know not physically fight in this case but there's a struggle there there is conflict there is a story you know but 
It, it's still pretty bad, as we'll get into, but um, at least an attempt was made. So this one starts off about eh, six months after the end of Halo. Now, uh, that is a small detail, but I actually kind of like it because it makes sense that Bethany and Xavier could be so attached to one another if they've actually been together for a long period of time. You know, we, we don't see all that much uh, when their relationship is developing, so it's still not a good relationship, but there's a lot of other books and stuff I've read where it's the same. You know, we still don't see much with their relationship or anything like that but they've known each other for like a week and they still are in love and they'll die for each other. Whereas in this, they've been together for a, a fair amount of time. So yeah, it, it makes sense that, uh, that they could form this attachment. So, okay, I like that. And apparently off screen, Bethany and Gabriel and Ivy made the town of Venus Cove amazing again. Over the past year, the influence of my family had spread and transformed Venus Cove into a model town. The church congregation had tripled in numbers, charity missions had more volunteers than they could handle, and reported incidents of crime were so few and far between that the sheriff was forced to find other things to occupy his time. Nowadays, the only disputes that happened were minor, like drivers over ar arguing over who saw a parking lot first, but that was just human nature. It couldn't be changed, and it wasn't our job to try and change it. Okay, uh, one, again, you're, you're pointing out that, hey, hey, everything is great here. There's no struggle or conflict whatsoever, which, like, I mean, I mean, if you're living in that situation in real life, then yeah, that's a good thing, but it's just not fun to read about, you know? And another question is like, how did this happen? What did you do? Why is the church congregation tripling in numbers? How did you do that? And why is it such a big deal? Like, they never mention them, or, or rather they mention once or twice that they do some like volunteer charity work, which is great and all, but how, do, how does that alone suddenly make the town better? Like, did you fix poverty by doing that? I don't think you did. Like, that, that feels like more of a band-aid to cover a bigger issue. But I guess that's not the point of the story, so let's just move on. So Bethany and Xavier and all their friends and everything go to a Halloween party at an abandoned mansion, which is called the Boo Radley House because Alexandra Adornetto has no imagination. And, uh... Bethany is also dressed up as an angel for Halloween, which is kind of funny, I'll admit. I'm a sexy angel. One of Bethany's friends brings out a Ouija board and they decide, okay, let's contact spirits, let's have a seance, which, um, that seems like a dumb idea for Bethany to do because she knows better. And she does think that, but then she goes through with it anyways, and honestly, a character being dumb and getting themselves into trouble is a fine way to start off a story, I guess. It's just when it happens later on, it starts to get annoying. But yeah, so a spirit goes into the board and warns them of evil and danger and all that, and they're kind of nervous, and Molly uh, freaks out, kicks the board, and that sets the spirit free, and I, I just want you to keep that in mind. Like, she sets the spirit free, which it turns out to be Jake uh, pretty soon after this, but Molly sets it free, meaning that everything that happens after this is Molly's fault, and no one ever brings that up. No one's ever like, you know, Molly you caused this issue, I think you should help us fix it, or anything like that. She's just like, oops, tee hee, I'm not like other girls, and then they, they never bring it up, up again, and they're just, hit, her and Beth are still best friends. It's, oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So they, uh, they leave, and Molly just, it, her date that was with her there, just some random guy named Ryan, uh, is high, so he can't drive her back. And she's like, are you high? And he says, not high, Ryan clarified. I believe the term is greened out. That, no one talks like that. Nobody talks like this. Oh my god. So Jake comes back. He opens a portal, which uh, looks like a literal highway to hell, which is... Again, that's kind of funny. I, I kind of like that idea. And then he comes out on his motorcycle, because remember, bad boys ride motorcycles. And then he grabs Bethany and drags her down to hell. And now she's trapped, like she can't open a portal or anything, and now she's trapped in hell, or Hades as they often call it. I'm not sure why they call it that, because Hades was a Greek god. He, he, was, he has nothing to do with Christian mythology, but... Um, okay, not a, not a huge issue, I suppose. And, uh, but the bigger issue is that hell is a hotel and a nightclub. Like, that, that's, what, that's what's in hell, is Bethany is not being tortured in a pit of flame or anything until she agrees to be Jake's lover. Like, she's just 
staying in a hotel, which happens to be... I, I mean, it's away from all her friends and family, so it makes sense she'd want to escape, but it really doesn't seem that nasty. And then she goes to, like, a nightclub, and she's thinking, oh, this is so terrible, these people are dancing and doing things of a sexual nature. Because, as we all know, sex is bad. It's not just a thing that people do with each other sometimes. It's bad. Like, I, I don't mind uh, some religious symbolism or religious ideas being put into books, especially books like these that deal with, uh, obviously, such heavy religious themes, but you don't have to beat us over the head with your morality. Like, I find that annoying. And basically, like I said, Jake wants Bethany as his girlfriend, and he also just wants to piss off heaven. Like, they, they want to piss off God and all that, so... Just that, that's his whole motivation for all of this. And they, they try to make hell seem a little bit more dangerous because Bethany, like, goes to this one area which is hidden away from the rest of hell, and that is, like, you know, the more medieval torture devices where the souls of bad people are tortured for all eternity, you know, that sort of thing, which is uh, fine, I, I guess. Like, that does make hell seem a little bit worse, but then Jake says, you're not in Kansas anymore, which is, like, the most pathetic attempt at a joke ever. And, uh, look, to, to make things even worse, like, you know, with the medieval torture, everything, excuse me, it seemed like, okay, maybe hell will be a little bit worse, but not for long. Because, you see, there's a demon named Tuck, and Tuck is a servant of, uh, of Jake, so he's basically there to lead Bethany around and show her what's going on in hell and keep an eye on her, that sort of thing. And he shows her this magic river, and Bethany drinks from it, and it gives her the ability to think really hard about her friends, and then she can see them wherever they are and whatever they're doing. Like, she can't interact with them, but she can observe them. And there's no limits to this. Like, she she can just, whenever she wants, like, close her eyes. Oh, that's what Xavier's doing, okay. And because of that, we spend around a third of the book with Bethany just watching others? And, um, that's not very interesting. You know, like, the, this, um... This idea that she's trapped in hell and doesn't know what other people are up to, that, that could work as a tension builder and as a, oh, I wonder if my friends are, I'm sure they're working towards a way to get me here, but I don't know what they're doing or if they're okay. Maybe they came down here already and they got caught by security or something like that. Like, you could maybe do something like that, but the, the fact that she's able to see them and see, oh, okay, they're doing all right and they are coming down to help me, that removes most of the tension, for one. And for another, it makes Bethany a passive observer in her own fucking book. Like, aren't you the main character? She, in this situation, shouldn't you be focusing on Bethany trying to escape on her own? Of her own intelligence, using her own talents, that sort of thing? Now, Bethany also has another demon servant, because, you know, when I think, like, the worst, most torturous experience imaginable, I think of myself having multiple servants and assistants that can help me do whatever I want, but... You know, she has another demon servant who is Hannah. Her, her name is Hannah, and she's not actually a demon in the regular sense. She's a, a dead soul, like a person who died and was evil, so she went to hell. And her and Bethany are kind of nice to each other. They get a little bit of a friendship going, and they talk about Hannah's life and Bethany's life. They, you know, they're just talking with each other, and it takes like five pages before Hannah stops dancing around the subject, and she just gets to the point about who she is and what happened when she was alive. Hannah leaned back and sighed. I hardly know where to begin. I haven't spoken about my old life in such a long time. Start wherever you like, I prompted. I'll begin then with Buchenwald. I need an adult. That is, that is the most insane opener to, to a character monologuing about their backstory that I have ever fucking read, I think. Like, that was, that was nuts. I, when I first read that, I had to put the book down for like 10 minutes and mentally prepare myself for whatever was about to come. Because this, oh my god. I, <laughs> I'm just gonna go over her backstory all at once. And then we're gonna circle back and go over all the little issues I had with it because there's a 
there, there's a fair number of them. So basically, Hannah lived in Germany during the 1930s, which was, you know, obviously an unpleasant time to, to be alive there. And uh, she was a kid, she, was, she said she was 17 years old in 1933, and she joined Hitler Youth, and then she later got a job at Buchenwald, which was a concentration camp, if you were unaware. And uh, at, while she was there, one of uh, her old neighbors that she was friends with when she was a kid, it was a little uh, Jewish girl named Esther, gets taken there as a prisoner, and she gets really sick. And Hannah's thinking like, oh man, she's gonna die. I, I, don't, I wish I could help her, but there's nothing I can do. And then Jake appears, and he's like, hey, I can save your friend, but you have to sell me your soul. And Hannah agrees to do it, and he keeps his end of the bargain. Esther does get healthy again, but then that doesn't save her. She gets killed in the gas chambers not long after. So the first big problem here is that um, this gets really dark out of nowhere, and then it gets lighthearted again. Like, like I was saying, this whole series so far has mostly been like, Oh, there's a puppy caught in a tree. This is the worst thing that's ever happened. It, like, it's lighthearted. You know, you don't suddenly have dismembered children and rape and all that out of nowhere. It, you, if you're going to do something dark like that, you have to either ease into it or just have it be super dark from the beginning. And just bringing up the Holocaust out of nowhere and then immediately dropping it afterwards. Just, what were you thinking? Like... Uh, okay, and um, number two, the smaller issue in my mind, are the issues with uh, the history. Uh, there, there's a lot of errors there. Like, for starters, Hannah worked at Buchenwald right after the 1933 election. Or at least the way it's written, it sounds like it was right after the 1933 election. The problem is that Buchenwald did not open until 1937, so that's already a problem. Uh, another issue is that Hannah could not have joined Hitler Youth because there weren't any girls in Hitler Youth. Oh, that's us. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. That was a boys' club organization, I guess would be a better word. Uh, girls had an equivalent, which was called the League of German Maidens, or the Bund Deutsche Mädel, but uh, it, was, it was separate because, you know, Nazis were super big on traditional gender roles. Like, uh, Hitler Youth was about learning how to be manly and tough and all that, whereas uh, the... League of German Maidens was about learning how to be a proper mother and, oh look, you know how to cook and make clothes and stuff. And uh, also, if if she was working at Buchenwald and she was 17 in 1933, and that means by the time Buchenwald opened she would have been at least 21, so she would be too old to be in either of the youth movements anyways. And then <clears throat> after that, Buchenwald was a concentration camp. It wasn't a death camp. Like, they didn't have gas chambers there. That's not to say people didn't die there. Many thousands did, but they died from stuff like not having enough food and not having proper medical care, or uh, in some cases being subject to horrible medical experiments, uh, and sometimes just being abused by the guards. Like, I'm not trying to defend Buchenwald by any means. It was a horrible atrocity, but it, it, it wasn't a death camp. You know, death camps had gas chambers, like, you know, Auschwitz and Treblinka. Th those had gas chambers, but Buchenwald did not. Now, I think that if you're going to bring up, like, how evil Jake is and how evil demons are and stuff like that, then using the Holocaust as subject matter is fine. Like, that, that's some of the most evil shit humanity's ever done. I think if you're going to try and drive the point home, yeah, that's good. But get the facts right. You know, like, a lot of people died in this, and if you're going to use them as fodder for your shitty angel romance novel, like, you owe it to them to at least Google some shit, because... This kind of feels like, it, it really does feel like Alexandra Adornetto just googled concentration camps, grabbed the first one that popped up, didn't, did no further research, and then just put everything in there, and nobody fact-checked her, checked her, which, I don't know, I'm, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. So with that out of the way, so Jake and Bethany continue interacting a little, she makes it clear how much she hates him, and he says that he wants to have sex with her, but um, she keeps saying no, which is kind of surprising. I mean, you know, she's in hell, she's trapped out there, there's nowhere she can escape. Like, I figure that the implication was spoken. The implication that things might go wrong for her if she refuses to sleep with me. Now, not that things are gonna go wrong for her, but she's thinking that they will. We also learn that Jake is no regular demon, he's one of the originals, meaning he was one of the 
angels that originally rebelled against God and was cast down into hell, aren't, aren't, aren't they all originals, though? Like, isn't that how demons were created? Like, okay, that's how it worked in the Bible, certainly. And if you want to change up the mythology for this, that's fine, but you have to explain it a little bit more. Like, if that's the case, where do other demons come from? Are they just created by Lucifer? I would assume, but there's, there's nothing explained about it, so what am I supposed to do? And throughout all of this, they keep showing little chunks where they're on Earth. And I don't mean like one or two page chunks. I mean, they'll spend like three chapters uh, just showing what's going on on Earth. And Bethany's just a passive observer watching stuff. And they'll show some other stuff in hell and then a bunch of stuff on Earth. I'm just going to go over all the Earth stuff at once right now. Uh, so Xavier and company are searching for a way to open a portal so that they can get down to hell and rescue Bethany. Makes sense. Um, they hear about a convent full of possessed nuns somewhere in Tennessee. So they go out there and they just help all the nuns and they, uh, they, they get the devil out of them so they're no longer in trouble. And while they're out there, Molly tries really hard to jump Gabriel's bones. Like, she tells him he acts like he doesn't have feelings, but she knows that she does. Then she forcibly kisses him, but he's just not interested. Like, she can't take no for an answer. It looks kind of pathetic, really. Like, sure, unre unrequited love, that, that can work fine. Like, that can be dramatic, it can be tragic, it can be funny in some cases. But you, it needs to be less annoying. It needs to be less creepy. It needs to be with a better character. Like, Molly's not likable. She's not a likable character. I, I don't know much about her other than she's obsessive over boys and makeup and stuff, like a stereotypical girly girl, and I, she's rude to everyone, she's mean, she uh, causes trouble, like I said, she's the reason Bethany got stuck in hell, and, like, it, if she had been a better character, maybe this could have worked to be, like, tragic or whatever, but right now, no, it's just really stupid and annoying, and I hate it. So then Jake, in an attempt to prevent them from attempting to rescue Bethany, he actually takes some of Bethany's uh, feathers, which have fallen off of her wings, and he goes up to Earth and he talks to them. Uh, but the thing is, he doesn't go to Earth as himself. He goes dressed as Diego, who was another kid they went to school with, who just kind of... he He's never really mentioned before this or after, so I don't know why he bothered going in a different body. And one thing about this that stood out to me, uh, Jake is white, and Diego is pretty obviously Hispanic. So if Jake is pretending to be him, isn't it, isn't that kind of like wearing blackface? So yeah, he he's there for a little while and he's talking to Xavier and uh, Molly and he actually pretends to be Diego for a few minutes and it takes them forever to pick up on, oh, that's actually Jake. Yeah, th this guy just materialized in our hotel room. I guess that's not the normal human that we went to school with. That might be the demon that we all know exists and like, it just makes them look really stupid. And again, it's that same problem of spending forever to do anything. You know, it's not just the descriptions go on and on. It's like the s conversations go in dumb little circles for a while, and then something will happen. And, like, it's just, it's really stupid and annoying. But, uh, basically, he's there for a minute. He shows them the, the feather that he took from Bethany, and he tells them, Oh, yeah, she's dead. Sorry. No need to come looking for her because, you know, I'm the villain. You can trust me. And then, uh, while he's there for a minute, uh, Xavier's angry, he's about to attack him, and Jake's like, bring it on, kid. And then Gabriel busts down the door, and he's like, ha, I could smell you. You're, you're Jake. We're gonna kill you now. And then Jake runs off. And the thing is, Jake seems surprised that they were able to, to find him there. But, like, he should know that his demon aura, they, they can sense that. Like, dude, why didn't you think of that? You haven't thought of the smell, you bitch! And not long after this, Jake possesses Xavier while he's uh, driving a car, and he drives it, like, towards the edge of a cliff while Bethany is watching, and she's like, no, no, please don't kill my boyfriend. I'll do anything you want. And then, basically, uh, Jake says, okay, you have to have sex with me, and I'll, I'll leave Xavier alone. And Bethany agrees, which is kind of gross, but it's also, like, supposed to be gross. You know, it's it's supposed to be the villain essentially raping Bethany, which is, you know, unpleasant. But again, this is a little darker than, 
you've had up until this point, which is just a weird tonal whiplash. And then Jake says that the purpose of sex is pleasure, not procreation. Jake, do you know what sex is? So, about 30 pages before the end of the book, uh, the Archangel Michael just decides to come down, visit Xavier and Gabriel and all the rest, and he gives them a device to open portals. Uh, how convenient. You know, it's just, they didn't have to work on anything to find a way to open the portal anymore, so all that earlier stuff they did was a waste of time, and now they don't have to actually struggle or sacrifice or anything in order to get down to hell. So what, what was the point of all that other stuff if we're just gonna have this deus ex machina pop out of nowhere? Like, you, you might as well have had Bethany never watch her friends and not know anything about what's going on, and then they just suddenly pop up later. Like, that, that would make about as much sense. So anyways, they go to hell, Gabriel stabs Jake and this time kills him for good, or so we're told, and Bethany is rescued because, again, she's the main character, but she's still the damsel in distress. And then, again, remember, all of this is in less than 30 pages, so just like before, there's no time to, like, get invested or anything. And then, uh, <clears throat> they go home, and they're just happy to be alive and all that. Uh, Xavier and Bethany and Molly and all them graduate high school, and then Xavier, right after the, gradu right after the graduation ceremony, he drives Bethany over to their church, and he's like, hey, let's get married. And they, he says, like, we're not going to tell anybody else about it until afterwards. Like, I talked to the priest. He's on, he's on board with it. Like, what do you say? We're both 18. Let's do it. Yeah, what, what could go wrong? You know, angels and humans are forbidden to be together. Like, what, what could go wrong? But Bethany agrees to it, and they're just like, okay, and that's, that's where book two ends. Okay, so this one... This one had potential. Like I said, a character being trapped in hell trying to escape. I think that's a, uh, I think that's a fine idea. You could do a lot with that. But everything was too easy. Y you know, like, Jake never actually uh, forces Bethany to do anything, which is kind of a blessing because I don't have to read about that shit. I'm sure it would not be handled very well. But n nonetheless, like, if hell had really been that terrible, at least it would have felt urgent that they had to escape. So even when they were able to escape that easy, or rather when Beth was able to escape that easy, it wouldn't have seemed, like, so pointless, you know? And uh, then, like I said at the end, the Archangel Michael just sort of gave him a device so they can open portals and go back and... real easy. They didn't have to give anything up. They never had to make any sacrifices. And because Bethany can just watch what's going on on the surface, the readers already know everything. You know, we know every obstacle, and so everything is on easy mode for the characters and for us, and the sad part is that despite all of that, it's still better than the other two books. So the final book is called Heaven, and I'm probably gonna breeze through this one relatively quickly. Like, it's a bit simpler than the others. Um, like, you might notice, there's fewer tabs in this one than in the others. That doesn't mean that, like, I found less stuff wrong with it, it really just means that there are a lot of points that, like I said earlier, a lot of points that were just kind of boring or bad in the same ways as earlier books, and I didn't want to repeat myself too much. And uh, there were a few bits that I was like, maybe I could comment on this, but it's really small and I don't care enough to, to actually talk about it. So, you know, I'll, I'll breeze through this one quicker, I think. And the thing is, this one has like eight different storylines, and none of them are related to one another. You know, they, they're all very straightforward, they don't feed into one another or affect each other in any way. They're, none of them have any twists or turns or downtime, uh, so we really get to know the characters or so that we have time to, like, build up towards any sort of big events. It Or who am I kidding? This is all downtime. Nothing fucking happens here. So this one starts with Bethany and Xavier getting married, and before the actual ceremony, they notice that, like, the earth is shaking and clouds are covering the sun and they just think that and go, oh, that's weird, and keep going through with it. Like, that seems like a sign that you shouldn't be doing this, girl, but they go through with it and uh, they mention that the church they're getting married in is called St. Mark's and that it was built by European colonists just after the Civil War, which is a very odd way of wording it. Like, like at that point, the United States was a sovereign nation, so Europeans coming over would be more like immigrants than colonists at that point. Like, it, it's just a very odd line, and it really stuck out to me. 
Okay, so their marriage goes through without a hitch, and then immediately afterwards, an angel comes down, like a special angel called a reaper. He comes down, and he's like, you shouldn't have done this, and then he kills the priest, and then takes his soul up to heaven. And he tells him, yeah, like, the priest's intentions were pure, so, he, you know, he'll go to heaven, but we'll deal with you two later. You're both dead. Like, he threatens them very, uh, very, in a very straightforward manner. And my question is, like, okay, if, if the priest didn't do anything, it, or if he didn't do anything wrong, I should say, why, why did you kill him then? Like, there was no sin involved. And, like, even in the Old Testament, God really only killed sinners. You know, he, he didn't kill innocent people, like, and in the New Testament, and after that, it's generally agreed that God doesn't really kill people himself. He just, like, lets them do their thing, and if they're bad, then they go to hell after they die, and, like, I... This is so odd. Like, there's so many deviations from Christian theology, but at the same time... Oh, who am I kidding? I don't give a shit. And for that matter, if the priest, if only his earthly life is over, and so it's not that big a deal because, you know, oh, he gets to go to heaven and have a party for the rest of eternity, then is any death really that scary or bad then? Like, you know, if, if Xavier really had uh, died in that car crash when Jake was going to throw him off a cliff, wouldn't he have just gone to heaven and then Bethany would see him again after she escaped one day? Eventually? Maybe? I... okay, sure. And Gabriel and Ivy are really mad about this, and Gabriel straight up comes out and says that Bethany is not... Just, just read. You do not experience emotion, Bethany. You wallow in it. You are controlled by it. And everything you have done is based entirely on self-interest. Just because you don't understand love doesn't make it wrong. This isn't about love anymore. This is about obedience and responsibility. Two concepts you do not appear to understand. Now, the thing is, Gabriel is treated like he's being a hard-ass for doing this. And, but he's completely right! Everything Bethany has done has been for her own self-interest, her own desire. She, she hasn't c done anything to complete her mission as far as we've seen, her mission to make the world a better place. What has she done with that? All she's doing is being obsessed with Xavier. And then, I, I mean, in the second book, she, it makes sense that she would be acting in her own self-interest because she's in hell, but like, other than that, She's, no, she's done nothing to help anyone else throughout this entire series. She's just been whiny and controlled completely, like Gabriel says, by her emotions. It's, she's selfish, she's hurt, she hurts others, and she never does anything to, to make up for it. So they need to go into hiding for a while, and so Bethany and Xavier go to a cabin way out in the middle of nowhere that Gabriel and Ivy found for them. And they're mostly alone for a couple of weeks while they're there. And it, it comes out that it's apparently a stolen cabin, which seems like a dick move, but all right. Like, like other people, th that belongs to somebody else and they're just staying there, but... Okay, whatever. And um, despite the fact that they're married, they do not have sex because they think that maybe heaven will be merciful with them if their marriage isn't consummated. Um, sure, I can see the logic there. That, that makes sense. And then uh, the, the evil angels who are after them find them again, and so they run off, and they decide to continue hiding out by going to college in Mississippi. Uh, okay, but like, if they're angels, can't they see everything? Like, if they're in heaven, can't they just observe the earth and see everything that's ever going on? Like, how are they able to hide from them? You know, maybe if the angels didn't have stuff that could open portals to anywhere whenever they wanted, they would seem a little bit uh, more fallible, and it would make sense that the, you could hide from them. But in this, they seem like these, you know, godlike beings that can do whatever the hell they want. So, oh, it just seems weird to have this, uh, on one hand, oh, they're crazy powerful and can hurt us and we can never fight back or anything. And on the other hand, oh, we can easily hide from them. Yeah, it's, it, all we have to do is go to another state. So while they're in Mississippi at their new college, at their new home, they take on new identities. And so rather than being Bethany and Xavier, they are Ford and Lori McGraw. They're not married, they're pretending to be siblings. Why? Like, the thing is, they're, they're in a relationship with one another, so like, if they get caught being intimate or something, and people think they're siblings, that's gonna draw attention to them, and the whole point of this is to not draw attention to themselves. So why not just give them the same last name and say like, oh, they're married. Like, j just say they're one of those weird 
Christian conservative couples who gets married when they're 18 because they're really horny and just wanted to have sex and then they have four kids and they're divorced by the time they're 25. Like, just, just say they're one of those couples. Like, they exist. The, the thing is, that does happen. Like, they do get caught being intimate together and another girl sees them and tries to run off and tell, but then Bethany catches her and using her angel powers, she removes her memories. I didn't know she could do that. Apparently Bethany can remove people's memories. That's, um, that's a thing that happens. But yeah, for the most part, um, all of their time at this college in Mississippi is just spent with them going to classes and meeting these new friends, which we don't care about, and they don't seem to really care about that much. And they never pop up again after this, so it's really just a waste of a couple hundred pages. Shut up! Oh my god, I don't care! Jesus Christ, at this point, you could cut most of the major plot points in this entire series down to a pamphlet. Like, you could just put it in a, in a little stack at a doctor's office, and people would pick it up and read it while they're waiting, and they would get about the same amount out of it that I'm getting out of it. So after Xavier and Bethany have been at college for a while, Molly shows up with a new boyfriend, and in fact they're actually engaged to be married, despite the fact that they've only been apart from one another for like three months, so she's known that guy maybe that length of time. And oh, also, throughout all of this, Xavier has not talked to any of his family, so he just kind of walked out on him one day and they don't know what happened, so that's, you know, that's, that's shitty, and the characters don't spend that much time talking about it or thinking about it, or contemplating the consequences of their actions in any way because they're kind of terrible people. And anyways, Molly shows up with her new boyfriend, and... M much like the Earth stuff in the last book, it just kind of deals this in little chunks. Like, he'll be a little bit right here, and then a little bit here, and then a little bit near the end. So I'll just deal with it all at once. Uh, basically, this dude is, like, overly controlling and kind of abusive, and he seems extremely religious, like he's in a cult. And at one point, he... I don't know, Bethany comments on him saying, like, hey, you can't have your own church, and he's like, what? We're just, it's just a different interpretation of the Bible. And she's like, you can't interpret the Bible! The Bible is God's word! And I'm like, Bethany, if you think that people cannot interpret the Bible, you blatantly do not understand how the Bible works. Like, you don't understand the linguistics of it because it's been translated into a bunch of different uh, versions, and some of those versions can be quite a bit different from one another, depending on uh, the word, the exact wording of it. Uh, you blatantly don't understand theology, because that's basically how all theology works. People argue about shit all the time. And you blatantly don't understand history, because why do you think the Protestant Reformation happened? Or a bunch of other shit before that, but, like, that's, that's the big one. Like, people interpret it differently. That's just how it works. Like, if you're going to say that it's impossible to interpret the Bible in any different way other than insert religious denomination here, then I, I just don't like you. So anyways, while they're trying to convince Molly to leave this dude, uh, Gabriel comes up to her and he says, like, very stoically and robotically, like, you know, you said I don't have feelings for you, or you said I have feelings for you and I claimed I don't, but like, maybe I do, I don't know. And like, they don't even kiss or anything, or even really confirm that Gabriel does in fact, like, have romantic feelings towards her, which is kind of good because it'd be creepy if he did. Remember, this guy's way older than her, and he was her teacher for a while, so it's, just, it's weird. And then Molly leaves her boyfriend, and that's it. I just saved you about 30 to 40 pages spread throughout this whole book. And uh, there's a couple of other subplots like that, and like I said, I'm mainly going to ignore them, and you're not going to notice. So eventually, the evil angels attack their school, and during the attack, they actually kill a couple of innocents, which, uh, okay, again, these angels are supposedly, like, doing the work of God, but they're killing innocents who haven't sinned. That feels like they're breaking the sixth commandment, you know, thou shalt not kill. But what do I know? Uh, and then Xavier is killed as well during the fighting. But because angels have amazing magical healing powers, they manage to he heal him. They bring him back. Like, he dies for a brief moment, and then they bring him right back, and they're like, oh, that's super great. But it turns out that he was possessed well, like, while he was dead, his body was empty, and so Lucifer was able to come into his body and possess him. Now, I, I should mention that Lucifer, uh, 
was in the last book a bit, but I just left him out. And like I said, you didn't notice because he was he was a very pointless character. He, he wasn't that interesting. He wasn't fun. He was just, he was there. Now, they try and exercise uh, Lucifer from Z Xavier's body for a little while, and it doesn't work. And then eventually, they get Lucifer to agree to something, and he says, Okay, I will leave his body willingly if Gabriel will let me cut off his wings. And the thing is, that sounds terrible, because when you get your wings cut off, you lose all your angelic powers, you become a human, uh, sort of. You're, you're sort of a human. The thing is, like, it won't kill him, uh, and they will grow back eventually. Like, it'll take a couple hundred years, and Gabriel will just be wandering the earth that whole time, but they will grow back, and I'm just thinking... That, like, the characters are treating it like he's gonna die, is the thing. No, you can't do it, Gabriel. You'll... Well, you won't die, but your life will suck for a while. And then Gabriel's cool with it, though. And the thing is... Well, like, why? You know, G Gabriel is willing to do it, and this would be a sacrifice that he would have to make, is the thing. Like... The main characters have not had to make any sacrifices so far, and this would be pretty much the first one. So he would go, you know what, yes, this, his life is more important than my current comfort. So he's like, yeah, just let him cut my wings off. And then some demons come up and they're going to cut his wings off. Um, also, Jake comes back for a minute, and he also possesses Xavier's body. And I don't know how that works because, okay, like in, in, this, in this world, when humans die we have like a soul, you know, something inside of us that makes us alive so we aren't just a hunk of meat. And when we die, that soul leaves our body and it either goes to heaven or to hell or to purgatory, um, which makes sense, sure. But Jake was a demon, you know, he, he was an angel. And so when he died down in hell, I figured that that meant that like whatever energy or particles or whatever made up his body were destroyed so he, he's just gone. He's gone for good. He's not in some other plane of existence the way a human would be. So if that's the case, how did they bring him back? I, I, I don't know how that works, but I'm also overthinking this. Anyways, while all this is going down, uh, Raphael, the angel Raphael, comes down, who has never been mentioned before and is barely brought up after this. He just comes down and he saves the day. Like, he... He just decides, oh, okay, I'll banish Lucifer from his body. Poof! And it's it's just that easy. So it's just another deus ex machina with no real sacrifice and no real struggle from the main characters. So the evil angels come again, and by this point, Bethany is tired, so she just goes with them, and... You know what? Sure, I need something to happen at this point. Just, just, just go. And so while Bethany is up in heaven, she meets an angel named Eve... Look, why, why, why would you, why would you name an angel Eve? I don't understand. Like, Eve was the name of the, the first human woman, and according to some interpretations, which I guess are evil or something, according to some interpretations, she is the reason for original sin. You know, she, she committed the first sin by uh, eating from the tree of knowledge and by being tempted by Lucifer. So, like, if your angels are supposed to be these perfect, pure beings that always do what God tells them, why would you... Why would you want to name one of them after her? That just seems odd, but... Uh, anyways, Eve uh, basically tries to make Bethany give up her feelings for Xavier so that she can go back to being a proper angel, and there's some really dumb dialogue about it. It isn't boring to be at peace, Eve informed me, to be at one with a collective cosmic energy that is greater than anything you can understand. Whatever, I muttered. I don't want to be part of your cosmic mosh pit. Haven't you seen Lord of the Rings? I choose a mortal life. And then later, while she's still trying to convince Bethany to give up her feelings, uh, Eve tells her that you and Xavier are not a healthy relationship. You're codependent on one another. You should be able to be apart for a while without losing your shit. And it's portrayed as Eve being like, un she doesn't understand what love is like, and she's just evil, the evil authority figure who always follows rules. But she's right, though. Xavier and Bethany are codependent. They can't be apart for more than a couple of minutes. Like, I can't even think of any real relationships that Xavier has outside of Bethany. Like, uh, there was the one he had before the story began with uh, his ex-girlfriend Emily, who died, which we, we never see, so that doesn't really count. And then we see, like, his family, you know, all, his parents and all of his siblings, he just kind of has one... They're, they're all lumped together. That's just one relationship he has with them, sure, but, like, 
What about his friends? I, I don't know, he seems to have given up on most of his hobbies and everything by this point. So, like, yeah, they do seem codependent on each other. Anyways, apparently there are rebel angels that exist that also don't really like following rules and they also think they should be able to fall in love with humans and stuff. And they agree to help Bethany escape heaven and go back down to Earth, uh, but they tell her that in the process she will lose her powers and become a human. You know, not like the way uh, Gabriel would have when he got his wings cut off where they would eventually grow back. Like, this would be permanent. She'd be a human. She'd live and die. And then she's like, yeah, that's cool. So they cut her wings off. She goes back to Earth, she sees Xavier, Xavier, whatever, and she's like, oh my god, I'm so happy to see you! And she's like, wow, you look older, and he says, oh yeah, it's, uh, it's been two years since you've been gone. And she's like, oh wow, I've, I've missed some stuff, but I'm glad we're here, I'm, I'm glad we can see each other again, and then they just, they have their happily ever after. And that's the end. And I will say that, like, at the very end, at least, Bethany did have to sacrifice something. She did have to give something up. It didn't seem like that big of a deal. You know, she didn't really have to contemplate it and say like, oh, do I want to become a human? Do I want to give up being an angel and uh, give up my very close relationship with God or anything like that? Like, it doesn't seem like that big of a sacrifice, but at least there was one. I mean, it is slightly better than the ending of Fallen, at least, where the main characters also got a happily ever after, but they literally did not have to give up anything in order to get it. It was just like, they got to the end and God's like, okay, boom, happily ever after, you're good. Um, but that's not really the end of this, because this copy of the book has a few extras at the end, including a uh, interview with the author, Alexandra Adonetto. And they ask her which character she most identifies with, and she says, in most ways, Bethany. Thank you for clarifying, Alexandra. You know, like, I couldn't tell that this impossibly beautiful girl with basically no personality who also goes from a foreign land to the southern United States to go to school, much like Alexandra Adornetto did, who went from Australia to, uh, I believe it's the University of Mississippi, she says, but, you know, the southern United States is where she went to school. Uh, like, I couldn't tell that that impossibly beautiful girl who lived a very similar life to you was just a self-insert. I couldn't tell. I'm not trying to sound too mean here, but, like, girl, you gotta do a better job of hiding it than this. And then, for whatever reason, there's like a four page long story from Molly's perspective and it just starts off with her saying, it's not easy being popular. In fact, it's really hard. That, that sounds like something Ebony Darkness Dementia Ravenway would, would say. Like that. That genuinely sounds like a line from My Immortal. I'm just... think things through a little bit. But, you know, it, it goes through for a couple pages. It's clear that, yep, she's a whiny popular girl, just, just, like, uh, just like I always thought. At one point she says, why is, why is Xavier so into Bethany? She does nothing for him. A solid point, which is never addressed anywhere else in the series. But uh, then it just kind of ends. So, like, yeah, it's, uh, it's pointless. You know, so I don't know what, what that final story was. But, you know, that is the end of the Halo trilogy for real, for real this time. And, well, Molly's story was kind of this series in a nutshell, when you think about it, you know. It was, it was pointless. Why was it there? It doesn't add anything, doesn't lead to anything, but we get to watch this girl who is completely full of herself talk about how amazing she is, but also how hard her life is because everything isn't given to her on a silver platter, even though everything kind of is given to her on a silver platter. And, um, that's really the whole series. It's pointless because there's no conflict. You know, there's a few points where characters want something and other characters are trying to stop them from getting it, or other forces or governments or whatever are trying to stop them from getting it, but there's very little of it. It's mostly just, oh, Bethany is into this dude? Well, now they're, get now they're together. They're, they're happy together. Or, uh, they need a way to rescue Bethany from hell? Well, there it is. There's the way to rescue Bethany from hell. They need a way to make Lucifer leave Xavier's body? There they go. They they made Lucifer leave his body. There's very little cause and effect here as well, which is kind of how a plot works. You know, you can't just be, a thing happens, and then another thing happens, and then another thing happens. Like, they have to kind of lead into one another and build towards something greater. And uh, the, the thing is, like, I get it. The author was very young when she wrote this, and 
I, I want to commend her for being able to get published at that age. That's that's impressive. But you can very easily tell that this was written by not only an author with very little experience, but an author who is very young and who has not had time to work on their craft that much. And uh, the story, as I've said more than once, there's not really any sacrifices that they have to make. You know, there's like it's kind of hinted at for a little while that like, oh, OK, in order to save Xavier's life, Bethany has to have sex with Jake, which is kind of like getting raped at this point. So, like, that would be giving something up, but it, it never goes through, so she doesn't actually have to do that. Um, that. Then at the end, she gets her wings cut off, which was, like, the one sacrifice she has to make, but even then, it's not that big of a deal because Bethany doesn't seem to like heaven. She doesn't seem to like living there. And I just... I don't know. What else is there for me to say? It's boring. It's without ideas. There, there's, there's nothing here that I can even point to and go, oh, maybe you could have done something with that a little different and it might have been good, or maybe you could have expanded on this character and they would have been interesting. Like, there's nothing there. There's absolutely nothing for me to even work with. Like, Fallen had ideas. It was, it was bad, but it had ideas. Uh, Onision's books had ideas. <laughs> they were some of the worst piles of garbage that have ever come out but like you know they they had they had ideas hush hush had a couple of good ideas and some of them were even done well weirdly enough, i know that's that's crazy and even the parts where they didn't have any real good ideas were also done okay this whole trilogy all these pages you see here is just boy meets girl they fall in love and there's nothing else there if this was a wattpad story then i'd be more forgiving of that because, well, that, that Wattpad you kind of just assume is, yeah, this is wish fulfillment. Here you go. It's, it sucks, but th this is what I wanted to write. And usually it's by young people who are just learning their craft. So, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it. But, like, why is this published? You know, I'm, I'm not saying why would Alexandra Adornetto dare try to publish something that I think is stupid. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, like, why would publishers look at this in its current form and say, yeah, th this is good. Let's uh, let's get this out, and we'll see who likes it. Like, you wouldn't think an editor or something would go through and say, okay, let's uh, tighten this up a little and tweak a few things to make it better. It doesn't feel like they did that. And for that matter, how did this series get popular? You know, like, Fallen, I can at least see why it got popular, because while it's not good, it kept tricking me into thinking it would get good at some point so I can understand why others would be in, into it. And Hush Hush, like I said, uh, is a decent story, so I can see why people would be into that. But I, for the people who are saying, like, oh, when I was a kid, Halo was my jam, I don't get it. I, I do not get it. Like, this feels too boring even for kids to enjoy. So that is pretty much all I have to say on the subject, you know. After this, I think I'm going to take a break from the angel, terrible young adult Twilight clone romance things. I'm gonna take a, a break from that because while they are all bad and it is kind of fun to poke fun at them, like, but believe me, if I wanted to sit here for another hour, I could probably have pointed out dumb lines and stuff in here, but for the most part, they're all just bad in the same way every time. Y you know, like, th they're not even bad in new or different ways, so I just, I don't like repeating myself too much, and that's what it, it feels like I'm gonna start doing, so I will take a break from these for a little while. And I might, uh, keeping on track with doing a bunch of terrible young adult books, I might do some of the terrible dystopian young adult books, like the Hunger Games clones, in this manner. So, like, if you have any suggestions for, like, really bad ones, then I guess throw them down below. Like, I, I have a few ideas, but I, I don't know. I, that one would be a little ways away because I just, at least those are bad in different ways. But not now because I already know what my next long, terrible book review would be. I asked in a poll a couple of weeks ago, like, what do you guys want me to do? Uh, I suggested an Angel Young Adult series. That was, you know, this, obviously. I suggested a terrible book written about a celebrity, which was not after. And I suggested a terrible book written by a celebrity. And now I'm just going to tell you it is The Way of the Shadow Wolves by Steven Seagal. Oh, yes, boys and girls. This should be fun. Thunk to patron names you see here, and thank also to $10 and up 
Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodes, Carolina Clay, Christopher Quinten, Embis, Great Gibo, Joel, Karkat Kitsune, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Madison Lewis Bennett, Micah Phone, Sad Mardigan, Samuel Nevin, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, and Vevictus. Without you guys, this would not be possible. And if you want to get your name on here, and you want to participate in stuff like polls to determine what my next video topic will be, or early access to my videos, then consider becoming a patron. If not, then maybe become a channel member, because that's a thing now. And, uh, I, I'm not good at outros, so, um, goodbye. See you later.